welcome to episode 20 of Little Big Knits. My name is Selma, I'm your host, and I'm coming to you from Ottawa here in Canada where I live with my family and our cat Yoda, who does not seem to be making much of an appearance these days. I think we'll have to wait for the colder weather before she starts jumping around. So this is a podcast about knitting primarily, although there can be other making and there will be other making today, such as sewing and some crochet. Um, you can find uh, me on uh, Instagram and Ravelry as Selma Knits. And on Ravelry, we have a group called Little Big Knits where you can find the show notes, you can introduce yourself, and thank you to those who have come and introduced themselves. I always love hearing about who's joining the group and it's really fun to say hello that way. There's also an Ask Away thread and our knit alongs tend to happen in there. So uh, yeah, come and, come and join the group if you like. And uh, thank you for joining me today. It's been uh, a little while again since I was able to podcast. Um, but I'm happy to be here today and I'm happy to have you. A special thank you to all the new subscribers because I don't know what happened, but in the last episode somehow I got a lot of new subscribers. So thank you and uh, I hope you continue to enjoy the podcast. And a special hello and thank you also to those of you who have been here since the beginning. Episode 20, thank you for, for being with me. It's been over a year since I've been podcasting. I started in June of last year, uh, so 2017. And here we are now in early October of 2018. So yeah, so today um, marks uh, also uh, 4,000 subscribers. So I'll be talking about a little bit of a prize for that in a moment. But first, I just wanted to mention the introduction and the title of this podcast uh, or this episode, which is uh, Places You Can Knit Finland. I did go to Finland. Um, I didn't tell you about that last time because I didn't know that I was going to be going to Finland. Uh, and I'll tell you a little bit more about that later on. But the images that you first saw were from our trip to Finland. We were there for only a week. It was not a lot of time and it was primarily a family trip. So there wasn't a lot of, of touristic stuff happening. But I thought I'd put in a few pictures and some tango music from Finland because for some bizarre reason, tango music is big in Finland. In fact, I wanted to do a little bit of research about how it is that tango music got to Finland. Um, because it really is an important part of, of the music culture in Finland and actually an other culture because there's people dance, there's competitions around tango dancing and it's a little different than Argentinian tango. But the piece that was played um, during the introduction and will be played at the end as well is called Lilian Kukka and it was by the Tango Republic. And I chose that one because I liked it but it so happens that Lilia is uh, my family's, my Finnish family's last name. So uh, I thought that was appropriate. So anyway, I hope you enjoyed that and there'll be more footage at the end of our trip to Finland as well. So yeah, 4,000 subscribers we've got on YouTube now, um, which completely blows me away. Thank you so much for subscribing. Thank you for joining me um, every week or whenever you can and or want to. Um, I really enjoy sharing a little bit of my knitting journey with you. So um, yeah, and I, somehow the last episode got a lot new subscribers. Um, thank you. Uh, thank you for all the beautiful, beautiful comments um, last time for those of you who shared your own experiences with loss. Uh, it meant a lot. And so I just thank you very much for, for for your comments and for your support and encouragement and, uh, and empathy. I really appreciate it. So I thought that since we have reached 4,000 subscribers that we should have a prize. So you may recall a couple of episodes ago, sorry, I am, it's a very overcast day today. Um, I am relegated to the bedroom again because my husband is home and the lighting is quite dark downstairs. So I thought we'll just podcast from the bedroom and I like the lighting except that it changes all the time and I don't have the fanciest equipment to to deal with that so anyway hopefully you're okay with that so for the 4,000 subscriber prize 
I had gotten these beautiful skeins of Urso yarn in her silk single ply a little while back. Um, here is the label. Can you see that? Hey, why is it now suddenly doing that? It was earlier, it was going well. Anyway, there is Urso yarns. And there are four skeins here. Um, this one is called uh, Just Like Heaven, and it's a very, uh, there we go, very sort of light cream color with flecks of blue and uh, beigey pink going through it. There are three of these, and then there is one of this one called Pivoine, which means poppy, I believe, in French. Or is it peony? Suddenly I'm confused. Anyway, uh, of this wonderful pink color. So these are meant to go together to, I think originally as a Zweig um, kit, but you can do whatever you want with them. So in order to be eligible for, uh, to win this, um, I would like you to comment in the YouTube uh, comments down below. You don't have to go into Ravelry. You can do it right here in YouTube. And I'd like you to tell me about your favorite or your loveliest or and your craziest place that you knit or have knit. Um, I think my craziest place was in the car driving. Not while I was driving, but at red lights. I really, really needed to get a hat finished. It was a really simple hat, so whenever there was a red light, I just started knitting, and as soon as it went green, I just picked up the, the steering wheel and went along, and I thought, okay, this is kind of crazy. So anyway, um, feel free to share your experiences uh, below. You can tell us a story or whatever, um, and that will uh, be a valid entry for the prize. Now, um, if you want to make any other comments, just include that in the entry, but every entry below will be, um, every comment below will be an entry for the prize. Okay. And then I will draw it next time I podcast. Hopefully in three weeks or so, I hope to be a little bit more regular than I have been over the last few months. I am seeing uh, an easier future ahead. So I hope that I can do that. All right. And again, thank you. Thank you for subscribing and being here with me. It's, it's a real pleasure to, uh, to be part of this community and to podcast. I really enjoy it. So thank you again. And then one last thing before we get into the actual knitting content is our summer fibers cow. We had a cow that started, when did it start? April 1st, I think which was uh, a knit along or crochet along during which you could um, knit with summer fibers uh, that are all plant-based and the content had to be at least a minimum of 45% and you needed to use at least 50 grams of yarn. So there were all kinds of items in our finished object thread and the knit along closed on the last day of September so I closed it first thing in the morning on October 1st and there were 181 projects all kinds of things lots of inspiration in there so congratulations to everybody who participated I will be posting a separate little mini sewed uh, for the prizes I won't do it during the regular episode so those of you who participated in the knit along look out for that and thank you again all right so I think that we can actually get into knitting content now. As I said earlier, there is, um, actually I'll tell you a little bit about the show today. There is sewing content as well today and there's a tiny bit of crochet. So I'll be starting with the finished objects and the whips for knitting and then moving into sewing after that. And then I'll tell you a little bit about uh, our trip to Finland and what that was all about. Um, some acquisitions and uh, maybe a little bit more about what has been going on and why I've been absent for the last couple of months. So in terms of finished objects, last time I showed you my uh, Sunshine Coast by Heidi Kiermeyer. I was almost finished. I had some concerns, if you'll recall. I was worried about the collar and the edge 
that they were rolling and that they weren't going to flatten out. And I was completely wrong because once I blocked this, it worked out so beautifully. So I'm just going to show it to you here. So as you can see, the edge just completely straightened out and you can see the lovely eyelet detail and the bottom also straightened out really beautifully. <coughs> So I'll insert a picture here of me wearing this sweater that I posted on, on a picture that I posted on Instagram of me wearing this sweater. This was a wonderful, wonderful project and I do suspect that I'll make it again because it is such a great sweater. This is made out of Louette Euroflax, 100% uh, linen, which was uh, given to me as a gift by Lynn, who is also known as Toll Baby and who has a podcast called um, The Wayward Skein. She used to be part of the Two Tangled Skeins um, and the Two Tangled Skeins decided not to record together anymore. So Lynn has started The Wayward Skein and Sue has also apparently started a podcast um, called The Tangled Skein. So uh, look out for those if you're interested. But Lynn had given me this yarn um, that had that she had uh, been given by um, a woman named Jessica, who's Sarah Nova Crafts, who had been given a whole bunch of yarn. <laughs> and it has finally become something. So it's great. The one thing I would say about this that is quite uh, transparent uh, with the linen, you can see that you can see through it quite a lot. So it's a layering piece. Um, I wore it with a white tank and you could wear it with, you know, I actually have kind of a minty green tank that I thought could look good underneath underneath this. So we're now heading into the fall weather. I, this was my last summer make really for the, uh, for the summer fibers knit along. So it's not really going to get much wear. Although this winter we are going to Uruguay, um, late winter, probably around end of, I think we're leaving the end of February, I can't remember exactly what day, um, so I'll probably take this on the trip with me and wear it down there. But this was a wonderful pattern, super simple, but just really nice details, like I love the yoke and there's this wonderful detail that, let's see if I can show you, there it goes in two different directions on each side. So there's this little detail that happens on the side, sorry, I'm just not showing this to you very well, that I think is just really, it's just really classy and neat and simple. And uh, so yeah, very, very nice design by Heidi Kiermeyer. And the, the yarn is absolutely wonderful. You know, linen, when you're knitting with it, you think, oh my gosh, this looks terrible. But as soon as you wet it. I just, I put this in the gentle cycle and then I just lay it flat. I didn't do anything special to it. And it just completely evened out the stitches and became a beautiful sleek garden, a garment that you expect from linen. I was at a uh, little fiber show here in Kempville outside of Ottawa um, last weekend or the weekend before. It was called the Fiber Extravaganza. It was the first time they had one. And um, there was somebody selling Louette linen and I was very tempted, but I decided to not do it for now. But uh, I, would, I could see myself knitting with this again. It's really beautiful. So that is the first finished object. The second one is the Tender, which I think I had made quite a bit of progress on the last time I showed you. And then um, I decided when we went to Finland, I took different projects, but I just really worked on this. It was just a great mindless project to have on the plane. It was a nice mindless project to have there. I tried to start a sweater in Finland and then had to just pull it out and start over when I came back. Um, so I ended up finishing this. I, I can't remember if I finished it on the plane or very very soon after I got back. I have not had a chance to block this yet. So I find that it's not quite as 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 light and airy as I know it will be and it'll also be wider once I've finished. But isn't that just beautiful? So this is the Tender by Manel. It's a free Ravelry pattern and 
Uh, it's just wonderful. And I double stranded it with Crooked Kitchen, her mohair base um, in Nanny's Linen, I think it's called, which is a very sort of light beigey pink mohair. And then um, a lace weight called Jasmine Scented Evening by Fondant Fiber, who's a dyer whose work I really, really like. So it's a great length. I'm very, very happy with how it turned out. And it's just going to be, it's, it's a wonderful width for a wrap. I added on a few more stitches. I think I cast on 91. I don't remember how many were needed for the actual pattern, however. So I just made it a little bit wider because I wanted it to be a wrap, but I also wanted to be able to, you know, wear it as a scarf and bunch it up, right? Because I am going to need the warmth come January. So it can also be worn under a coat and bunched up or in various knotted forms or even like that looks quite nice actually so there you go so this is the second one I so enjoyed making this the rhythm of the the, the pattern itself is really nice and the combination of the yarns it's just luxurious now mohair you know there are stray hairs all over the place so if you're really sensitive you might not like it um, but the silk content in both yarns, because the lace weight by fondant fiber was a wool silk blend, um, and then the mohair was also a mohair silk blend. So the fiber content in, in both of them with the silk, just it's just so luxurious, and it's going to be really warm, and I'm very much looking forward to, to using this in the coming months. Because we had a crazy hot summer, but winter is coming. It's just the way it is. Nothing you can do about it. <laughs> so that's it for so uh, for knitting uh, finished objects for now. So I'll tell you a little bit about what I've been working on. Before I do, though, I am going to take a sip of my tea, which is in this wonderful mug that my friend Kate of Hawthorne Cottage Craft gave to me when she came last year to visit from Ireland for Rhinebeck. And by the way, we'll be going again this year and Kate will be arriving not this coming Monday, but the Monday after. Um, but this is a, by Nicholas Moss, I believe, uh, an Irish potter and it's a huge mug. And I'm actually drinking some tea by David's Tea called the Buddha's Blend. Let me see. Yeah, we have a little problem here, don't we, with this overglare. There we go. It's a white green tea blend um, with jasmine and hibiscus blossoms in it. And uh, it's a very sort of citrusy, fragrant tea, I would say. It's got the jasmine and the blossoms, so it's lovely. I think I just oversteeped it slightly. What I find with white and green tea is that they get bitter really easily. You have to steep them so carefully. And so I don't make white and green tea very often for that specific reason. Anyway, on to works in progress. So the first thing I brought out is in this bag that a friend of mine, a friend Dana in Germany made for me a couple of years ago. And it's a great um, sort of sweater project size. I am making the little garden. Uh, by Junko Okamoto, Okamoto, Junko Okamoto, which I'll put in the down bar anyway. And there are very few pictures of it in the actual pattern, but it's a very sort of oversized, loose fitting, kind of bohemian looking vest, open vest. So there is a picture of it. <clears throat> and I just really, really like the the look of it. And I had some Baramutitis yarn. Here is the label. In this sort of red, wine red colorway called Bantam. And I have a blouse which would look really great with this. And so I decided to make it for the blouse. And I'll insert a picture here so you can see. So that it'll kind of become an outfit now, 
I haven't been in the best headspace, I'm going to be honest. Um, another project that I started as well, actually the last two projects that I started a garment, I just really struggle to get things going and, I, and I've sort of realized it's that my head hasn't been in the greatest of spaces. So I have really struggled to get this thing going. Um, partly I think because it's kind of hard to see at this point because I've knit so little and because it's very fine, it's hard to see what I've actually done. Um, but so there's not a whole lot to show you. The stitch markers are the greatest thing to show you at this point, which are these wonderful cat um, stitch markers that my friend Sue, of, who's now of the Tangled Skein, uh, gave to me at some point because I just, I just love these cats. Look at these guys. They're kind of grumpy looking. And then she also gave me these yellow stitch markers at one point. And I'm terrible because once I use stitch markers, I just put them wherever. And so I have a really hard time getting a group of stitch markers that all look alike. Not that they all have to look alike, but Anyway, and these wonderful, they've got sort of a yellow, a yellow bead on them. So um, I've just started this, not a whole lot to say. Um, I've had a hard time getting it going. And I decided to focus on the other two garments for now. Um, and partly that's probably because I'm not a very good multi-knitter. Um, but once, uh, once the other two are finished, I'm gonna get back to this. It's kind of been on hold, and then I'll be able to really focus on it and get it going. So I'm looking forward to that. But that's one thing that I've started since the last time I saw you. I think the last time I saw you, I couldn't figure out what I was going to make next. And I was swatching in all kinds of ways. And then I ended up um, casting something completely different on. And I ended up casting on the All the Love by Jochi Locatelli, which is a pattern that actually Sue, <laughs> this is going to be the Sue show, Sue gifted to me uh, last year. Thank you, Sue. Or when did she get to Well, whenever it came out. Um, this was a pattern that Hoki designed for which the proceeds go to a school, I believe, in um, Buenos Aires. And uh, so, um, you know, Sue bought it for that reason to give it to me, which I really appreciate because it's a very lovely pattern. And it's, um, again, sort of, oh, he's really great at creating these sort of oversized, loose-fitting garments. And this is exactly what that's going to be. Um, I'll put a picture of the actual pattern here so that you can see what it looks like. But um, I finished the body. It's all wrinkled because it's been in the bag. Um, and I've started the sleeves. And I have to say, I don't usually have a problem knitting sleeves but this one is going to be a bit annoying because the skeins were it's a hand dyed yarn and the skeins were just all different enough that I really had to alternate um, it turned out I would say reasonably well on the front you can see that there's a line like sort of around here a bit um, but otherwise it's pretty good, but the last ball is quite different from the others. So um, I'm having to use the last two bits from the body and the new ball uh, to do the sleeves, which means I've actually got three yarns going and that makes it quite unpleasant to knit. Um, the yarn is great. It's, it's, um, it's just hand dyed and that's what happens, right? It's, the, uh, it's by Julie Asselin. Come on, come on, light. Hello. There you go. It's Julie Aslin Lezu DK, and it's a 90% merino, 10% silk. I've used her Lezu fingering, and that yarn, I have to say, had a really interesting texture, and her Lezu fingering has the same composition, 90% uh, superwash merino and 10% silk. This one really just feels like a superwash yarn. I, I can't say that the silk really adds anything unusual to it. Um, it just feels like a, a superwash yarn. But, um, you know, it's been great to work with. And this is yarn that I had in my stash for quite a while. This is her dappled gray colorway. And uh, it's just gonna be a really easy sweater. I'm hoping to have it for, for Rhinebeck uh, so I can wear it there. 
and I think I will. I'm almost finished the other one that I was also making that I started after, but I kind of got, uh, once I finished the torso of this one, I went on to the next one, which I'll show you. But yeah, it's it's just a very well written pattern. Hohi always writes patterns really well, and um, it's a great concept. I really like the way she starts her sweaters. They're, it's really neat, and I'm hoping to make the uh, granito next by her. Um, I've got the yarn. It's been waiting for a while, and um, and I, I I'm assuming that it's going to be a similar start to the sweater with short rows and shaping and it's a, a seamless construction. So this is going to be finished the next time I podcast because that'll be after Rhinebeck and I'm hoping to finish this for Rhinebeck and uh, I'll get to show it to you at that point. This has been in my sort of bucket bag by Buku, which I just love. Like, is this fun or what? I really like it anyway. Um, it's just a great size. It's a heavy canvas bag. It's got these leather handles. Um, it's easy to carry around and it's perfect for a large sweater. So that is my work in progress number two. I then started the ranunculus. I have no recollection who's a designer of the ranunculus, so I will put it here in the down bar. But it is a sweater that has been made um, by many people. Actually, uh, if you watch Espace Tricot, um, Melissa recently was wearing one. And um, I wanted to use this mohair that I had in my stash, which was by Fleece Artist. It's her, her oh, look how beautiful the color is coming up beautiful. This is Fleece Artist Zambezi, which is a, uh, I think again, a mohair silk blend. That's right. 70% mohair, 30% silk, and it's in her mink colorway. It's just, just stunning. And I have been pairing this for this sweater with, there's just a little bit left, there's another skein of this. This is uh, Wollmice Lace Garn in the Mausenschwanzchen uh, colorway. And the, together they are turning into this. And I, this I showed you the swatch. Well, I didn't show you the swatch. I showed you the yarn last time. You didn't see the swatch. I am on the second sleeve right now and almost finished, but I just couldn't get it done. Here is what it's looking like. I think that is the true representation. Sometimes it looks a little bit brown, but there is this purpley undertone to it. And it's just... A delight. I can't wait to finish it. I decided to make it with the longer sleeves, which I've finished here. I just haven't, you have to, after you finish the I-cord, you have to uh, graft them, and I haven't done that yet. It's supposed to be a sort of very short, boxy, wide sweater, which I've done, but I think I might rip out the body and add, an, like, just an inch. I find it, I keep Although I, what I might do is I might block it first and then see what happens because right now I keep wanting to pull it down a bit so that tells me that it's just, for me, just a little uncomfortably um, cropped. So, but it's really, really, really lovely. I'm really, really enjoying this. And again, if you wanted to make it with the short sleeves, this is a one skein project. If you have one skein of fingering weight yarn that you didn't know what to do with, you wish you'd bought a sweater quantity, well, guess what? You get a mohair to go with it, and you've got a sweater, or a vest anyway. Um, and I tried this on when it was at the short sleeve stage, and I really quite liked it, although perhaps a little longer, so I thought one could really quite easily um, make one out of, you know, a, a good-sized fingering weight with some mohair to go with it, and you've got a wonderful wonderful sort of vest layering piece. So this has been a super duper knit. Now, I mentioned my headspace, and so the yoke, and I have to tell you, the yoke is looks a little fancy, but it's really not hard. But it took me so long to make this yoke because I just kept doing bizarre things. But I got there eventually. And then there was a time when I dropped stitch, a drop stitch many rows behind and I had to pull out. And then there were times when I hadn't done the increases properly and anyway it was just I just couldn't I started laughing at myself because I just couldn't believe how long it was taking 
to get this darn thing <laughs> done. And I knew that once I got past the yoke, really the rest of it was going to be easy sailing. It's knit on six millimeter needles, so it's really fast going. And um, yeah, I think the next time I make it, it'll probably make me very little, take me very little time. I have a friend who's really interested in having one and I'd love to make it for her. Um, so it'll be much easier the second time around, but yeah. So this will also hopefully be going to Rhinebeck with me. I literally have about this much left for the sleeve, which because it's at such a loose gauge, will take very little time. So this has been an awesome project. Um, I'm making the small size because there's such a crazy amount of ease. Um, normally I probably wouldn't make the smaller one, but there are modifications for larger sizes as well. Um, so if you wanted to do it at a, at, a, at a tighter gauge, you could use one of the larger ones. Um, but it's just been a really, really fun project. And the yarn combination, again, I love mohair. So the combination of the mohair with other things just makes it an absolute delight to work for, with for me anyway. So those are the three knitting projects that I have been working on. Um, primarily all the love and the ranunculus. And then as I said, I'll pay attention to the little garden. I am, however, going to probably cast on something else afterwards because if the little garden continues to be one that requires concentration, um, there are times that I need something that's a little bit more mindless, so. But the last thing I'm working on, if you've been watching this podcast from the beginning, you've never seen, and yet I started this project in 2015. It's really been kind of in hibernation for well over a year. I had the intention of finishing it, and it just never happened. It's outgrowing this bag, but this is a bag huge sort of quilted bag with birds all over it by Quince Pie on Etsy that I really like. And what it is, it's a granny square blanket. Now I started this blanket in 2015 using minis uh, and I made gazillions of squares. As you can see, it's just full of them. It's like super colorful. This is going to be a blanket for my daughter, my, and she loves it. In fact, uh, she kept calling it her burrito blanket because I'd put it on the floor to look at it and she'd roll herself up in it. I started this in 2015. It was supposed to be a twin size bed, or twin size, like bed size uh, blanket. And I certainly have enough squares for that. Um, however, I ran out of the cream yarn that goes around, which is the Sandus Garn Sisu. It's a really good, uh, good price point, uh, solid um, fingering weight sock yarn. So it's a, it's, a, it's a wool nylon base. So I ran out of the cream and I thought, oh, no problem. I'll just go and get more cream. Um, and I, I was, when I ran out of the yarn, I was part way through a row and so I brought the new yarn home, I started adding more squares on, and then when I stepped back I realized, whoa, there's a big difference between the two creams. Um, a noticeable difference. This cream, this original cream, is a little bit more, I don't know, somehow a little bit more yellowy, and the other one was much more white. Not white, but more in that direction, and it made a huge difference. So then I was in a quandary. What do I do? Partly, I'm a little bit tired of making this blanket and I want it to be done. But also, I have this problem with the yarn. So I went to look for the yarn, um, and uh, which is at the store that I bought it was Wool Time here in Ottawa. And they said, you know what? None of the bags that we have look like that anymore. So I decided to just stop the blanket and it's going to be, it's still quite large. Uh, I haven't measured it, so I can't tell you, um, but it's going to be more of a day blanket than an actual blanket blanket, which is fine. I really didn't expect her to use it like that. I thought it could be more of a, you know, like a, a top blanket for her bed or something like that. 
So then my next problem was that I wanted to do a border on the blanket and I wanted it to be a cream border. And then I was like, well, the cream being different, is that going to look good or is it going to be kind of weird? So I decided to put on a turquoise border instead. So I'm in the process of doing the turquoise border. And I'm continuing the granny motif. I think I'm going to do three rows of the granny motif. And then I'm going to finish it off with a probably a scalloped or a pico edging. Um, so it has a different look than I was intending, but Isla loves turquoise, which is why I chose this color and I think it'll be just fine. I've counted and there are 110 squares. I actually have 50 other squares waiting, so I might just end up making a second blanket and buying a large enough amount of the new kind of cream so that it, it all works. Um, but yeah, basic sort of granny square and then I would attach the squares as I went along. And I think it's going to be fun. I have sewn in all the ends. So I decided that when I pulled this out and I really want to finish it for Ida's birthday, it's in November. And I thought I'm going to work on it 10, 15 minutes every day. And I've been pretty good about doing that. Some days I work an hour and then the next day nothing, but I've been working on it consistently. Um, and so I decided to start by sewing in all the color, ed uh, color uh, squared ends because I hadn't been doing that as I went along. I think next time I make a blanket, I probably will. Although I'm realizing I've missed a few. Here's one, but that's okay. The majority of them are done. And then once I finished the color ends, I decided to start doing the, the crocheting. And I think then once I finish the crocheting, I'm going to go back and do the rest of the ends. And uh, I think it's going to actually be finished. I'm really excited. It's, it's huge. Woo! Just goes on. I mean, it's not a twin size bed for a twin size bed, but it really is a good size. And I do think I'll probably make another one. I have all those squares and I thought, you know, our sofa in the basement um, could use a blanket. So I'll probably do that. So that's the last thing that I've been working on. I've been using a three millimeter prim needle, uh, which is actually my favorite kind of crochet. I'm not a big crocheter. I'm not very experienced. I'm more comfortable in the round than back and forth. But um, I do very much enjoy these. They've got a nice grip to them. They, they, they're they smooth and go along really nicely. So that's what I've been using. So that is essentially the end of the knitting that I have been doing. So let's move on to some sewing. Well. I think a couple of episodes ago, I told you that I was, or maybe it was last time. I don't remember. Anyway, um, I was taking a sewing class to make the Moneta dress, which is a um, Jersey fabric dress. So I was taking that class to learn to make a dress, but also to learn about Jersey fabric. I had chosen uh, some crazy fabric, and I still think I might be out of my element with this. But anyway, the dress is finished. The course was great. Um, I ended up, the last class was actually the day we were leaving for Finland. Um, and that was the day I was going to be finishing the class. And uh, I was determined to do it before I left because I knew that if I didn't, the teacher might not have time for a while to help me with finishing the garment. But um, I did do it and it was great. And it was such a good experience. So here is the dress. Now, I really enjoyed the course. I am still a little torn about this fabric. Um, and I'm also not 100% sure about the fit of this dress for me and my style. Um, I haven't actually posted it on Instagram yet, but I'll, put, I'll take a picture and I'll put it in here so that you can see what it looks like. It's got a very retro look to it, which I really like. Um, I love the, the, I really love the boat neck of it and I think that's really good. I'm just not 100% sure about the fabric um, and the shape of it. 
but um, I'm still determined to wear it and I'm really glad I, I made this. It was such a good experience and demystified so much for me. Um, so whether I wear it or not, it's okay because it was completely worth the experience. Somehow I got over a lot of my intimidation with sewing with this with this outfit. Um, and it was neat. We did we did the bodice first as a sort of with basted stitch stitches. We did the bodice and one of the arms so that we could see how it fit. So that was a really good experience. You know, it wasn't a full muslin, but it was enough to make you you know, kind of like a swatch almost, and then we ripped out those basted stitches and then went forwards with the full, with the full garment. Um, and we learned to use the twin stitch. It was great sewing with, uh, with jersey, and I'll definitely do it again. In fact, I ended up buying some fabric in Finland and um, hoping to make some jersey fabric and hoping to make some more jersey garments. So, um, yeah, this was really, really, really a great experience. I'm just not completely sure about this. I think I could get away with it. I've got a cardigan that could actually work. I bought yarn to make a cardigan for it. Um, but yeah, the shape of it is a little bit, a little bit out of my comfort zone in terms of what I like to wear. My waist is not something that I like to emphasize a whole lot. Let's put it that way. Anyway, but that was a great, great experience. So I have taken, I took a, a sewing class for skirt. I learned how to make a skirt, which I actually have worn. I took a, a finishing techniques class, which was great. And now I've taken this class uh, to the, the dress class with Jersey fabric. And I have to say, I think with all of those classes, it gave me enough skills and confidence to feel like, okay, I can tackle something on my own. So I did. I made the top that I'm wearing. This now there are a couple of problems with it that I have to fix the next time around like this needs to be pulled up here um, Just a little bit So I'm going to be uh, modifying the original pattern, but this is the willow tank by grain line studio and I made it out of a wonderful sort of um, kind of metallic gray fabric that I really really like and I made this all by myself and it turned out well enough to wear it's not perfect some of the um binding was kind of not quite sewn in quite properly but that's okay but i made a muslin first out of an old sheet which was a great idea that luli of or lou of the luli podcast um and and etsy shop mentioned on her podcast and i thought what a great idea you don't have to go out and buy fabric or use good fabric, I thought, surely I can find an old sheet to make a muslin with. So I did, although I had just cleaned out my linen closet and gotten rid of a whole bunch of sheets, which I won't be doing again, because um, it was a fabulous idea. So I made a muslin, I saw that it was a little bit too loose around here. I didn't see this part here. It's just, it, there's just a little bit of too much there. So. Um, I didn't see that because I think you can only see that once you have the binding in and you see how it really, really sits. But I still really, really like it. And it's just got a lovely, you know, slight A-line um, cut to it. And uh, yeah, I really, really am happy with this. And more than anything, I'm proud. <clears throat> because I actually made something, um, I figured it out as I went. I followed all the steps. I actually ironed things. I folded things properly. Um, it was just a real, a real joy. It took me a long time because I don't have a sewing room. I do everything in my dining room. Um, so everything happened in little bits of like 15 and, and or 30 minutes, but that's okay. It was kind of a good mental exercise for me. Like I decided on my size. I cut out the pattern one day. The next time I cut out the muslin, then I sewed the muslin and and then I tried the muslin and decided to modify things and you know so I just did it in all the stages rather than doing it in one sitting and I think that worked for me. I have bought fabric for a second one and I do hope to make that uh, you know in the next week or so so perhaps the next time a podcast I'll be able to show that one to you. I'm going to make some modifications just um, trim off the top here so that that gets pulled up a little bit more 
um, and then I think that it'll be good. If you happen to have any other comments about the fit, please let me know because I know that there are people out there who are more experienced, but I really do think that just lifting that up a little bit will probably be uh, the best thing that I can do for it. So those are two finished sewing objects. Um, it's really interesting. I was I went to this the shop where I bought the fabric, which is called Fabrications. It's here on Wellington, and they have a really lovely selection of fabrics. And I was saying to the woman how you know when you finish a knitted garment, it's like this slow, quiet satisfaction. But when you finish something sewing, there's like this exhilaration that comes with it because it's faster and it's just like suddenly boop boop there it's done. Um, so that it's kind of a, a different type of experience when you're sewing and when you're knitting and uh, and that's kind of fun to experience I never would have thought about that so anyway I'm just happy to finally actually enjoy sewing it's been this weird uh, process for me and um, and I'm looking forward to making more things and um, learning about garment making from that perspective as well so I think that's pretty much all my making. I did want to share you with you a little blast from the past or makings from the past uh, with you. I sort of mentioned this to you um, last time and so I thought I'm going to do that now. So you'll have seen there a couple of images of <clears throat> my mother knitting or wearing uh, knits from the past. And so I thought I would share with you some um, early knitting uh, things that she made and that are still wearable, which I find amazing. And some comments on yarns and gauge that was used perhaps at one time or perhaps is more common in Scandinavian knitting. My mother is from Finland. Um, as you know, she grew up in Finland, was born in um, an area of Finland called Pohjanmaa in a place called Nivala. And it was a small, small town. They did move away from there and she grew up in another town later on. Um, well, they went to Kauhajoki and to Lapua, in case you happen to be from Finland. And that is the place where I spent my time when I went to Finland now, in the summer. So, you saw in the picture of her uh, skiing, and I'll show it again here, um, that wearing a sweater, she's actually wearing this sweater here, which she made. It is a yoked sweater. I suspect, oh, it's a yoked, no, it's not. Oh, that's interesting. Whoa, this is an interesting construction. I hadn't even really paid attention. I'll, I'll talk about it in a moment. But this is a sweater that was considered, a, I think, a ski sweater. It's very densely knit. And in that picture, she was a teenager. So this was made in the 50s. Um, and she would ski to school. So she would wear something like this if the weather wasn't very cold. Now the construction on this is fascinating. This is actually a drop shoulder construction. There is actually a seam here to here. But then the yoke was picked up and knit in the round. And what you see here are the jogs from the color changes. So that's really interesting. It is sewn on the sides and it's a little bit of a turtleneck here that turns over. So there you go. This is one knit and uh, Alejandro was saying, you really should show that to Isla. She could wear it because it's in fabulous shape. Uh, it, it, it certainly feels like wool um, it's a very, very dense wool, and um, it looks like it's, it, it was certainly a very thick wool, and it's in great shape. So we'll see if anybody wants to wear it. It does smell a bit like mothballs. <laughs> I'd have to get that smell out of it. 
The next thing, and there's no picture to go with this one, is a picture of a Chanel suit. If you ever watched the Two Tangle Skeins and if you came, uh, were um, a watcher of theirs and saw, you, might have, you may remember me showing this on there. This is a suit. There's actually a skirt that was made. So here is the skirt. It's, got, it's not lined, but it's got an elastic in the waist, which is open. Um, and then it's got these stripes. It's out of a brown kind of tweedy yarn, but this yarn is actually a boucle yarn. A boucle yarn is one where you have like the little, little twirls of, of the mohair on it. And that is a boucle yarn, so it's kind of an interesting texture. It's kind of a reddish brown. And here is the jacket. It's got pockets on it, and it's got this interesting detail, which I think was put on after. And it almost looks like the yarn is multi-stranded and then somehow braided. And it's got these beautiful sort of brass buttons. Let's see if I can get, there we go. The inside of the button band is lined. Uh, the buttons uh, um, do go all the way through. And it's really quite beautiful. So this was a Chanel suit. It was probably made in the early 60s. Um, unfortunately, I don't see any pictures of my mother anywhere wearing it. Um, I've looked a little bit. Um, but this has kept really well as well. Unfortunately, this one did have a few moth holes and my mother-in-law, who is the master darner, fixed them. I don't even know where they are anymore. So yeah, this is, uh, this is a beautiful piece. I can wear the jacket. Um, but the skirt is a little on the tight side for me. But I think I'm gonna start wearing the jacket actually the black t-shirt underneath and a pair of black pants, for example, or something like that. It's quite beautiful. I've actually been wanting to make a Chanel jacket myself, and there is one pattern that I've seen that I like by von Himmerstein, I think. I'll put it down here. It's called Nearly Chanel, and I actually have the pattern. Um, and. I just haven't actually looked for the yarn for it, but I think I'm going to make a more of a sort of purposeful um, task of that and, and do that. I think it could be a really nice sort of jacket to wear, cardigan jacket to wear um, in an informal or formal setting. I mean, it's the kind of thing you can dress up or dress down. So anyway. And then the last cardigan uh, which you can see in this picture of my mother and my father and me as a little baby. Uh, you can see her wearing, I'm actually wearing now. Uh, here it is. It's a lace cardigan with a crocheted edge, which is scalloped. And it's a, a sewn set in sleeves cardigan. It's such a wonderful cardigan. As you can see, now I have to be honest, I'm 52, so that means that this sweater is about 52 years old because I was an infant when she was wearing that. Perhaps it's a little bit older. Um, and it's just an incredible state. It's in, in beautiful, beautiful shape. It has kept up. There is the occasional pill, um, but it's just kept up so well. There's scalloping on the edges there, but you can just see the quality of this of the yarn and the stitch definition and I don't wear it often but I've been wearing it for years um, and I think it actually looks really great with my new top so I think hey I've got a new outfit um, and so this was kind of interesting looking at these knits and thinking about them another one that I found um, is this little baby sweater that would have been mine I probably wore it for two minutes because what baby stays this teeny weeny size? They don't stay this teeny weeny size for long. But this is one that was made with just a natural yarn with a butterfly slip stitch type of thing on it. 
And one thing that I've noticed about all of these projects, and there are other knits as well, that um, a few more that I have from when I was little. What I've noticed are two things really. Um, the gauge. Everything is knit at a far tighter gauge. We're very much today into loose gauge knitting and really lofty sort of loose gauge and soft. And I think that in Scandinavia, there's still, especially when you're making a ski sweater or things that are meant to be worn outside, I think tight gauge is really important. And I think it's still a little bit more part of that culture. But I find generally today that we tend to have things at a much looser gauge. Um, but there, are, and the other thing that I noticed, sorry, is that um, obviously the quality of the yarn, these items are in amazing shape and they've been around for a few decades at this point. And so there's a quality of the wool, uh, it was serious wool, it was meant to last. And so there's, there, with the tight gauge and the quality of the wool, you have an, a garment that lasts a long time and that has practically no pill, no pilling happening at all. And I have to say that's something that's been on my mind a little bit, um, wanting to buy yarns to make garments that are going to last. And so I feel like I'm starting to think about that more. I may not always, because when you see beautiful yarn, you just buy it and you don't necessarily think about longevity. And just because something was, you know, hand spun, it doesn't necessarily mean that it's going to have that longevity. Um, and just because it's commercial, it doesn't mean that it's going to have that longevity. So I'm not quite sure where I'm going with that, but it's just something that's on my mind, especially when I see and uh, a garment that was made 50 years ago that is still completely wearable today. Um, for its style, but also because of, of, of the quality of the fiber that was used for it and the kind of knitting that was done. So yeah, so that is my little blast from the past for today. Um, I told you that I'd share some different things here and there, but I thought I'd start with knitting. It was a little bit easier than some of the other things, but anyway, let me know what you think. Hope, you'll in, hope you enjoyed it, and if you want to see more, let me know. And so that's that. So I thought I would tell you a little bit about Finland and show you what I got in Finland. Um, and then tell you a little bit more about uh, stuff that's been going on, which you can stick around for or not. So we went to Finland. I found out actually just after I podcasted last time that my mother's brother, her oldest brother, there were five, um, had passed away. He was 87. He wasn't uh, doing so well at this point, and he passed away. And so I decided to accompany my mother to Finland because she's unable to travel on her own anymore. And um, it was kind of the right time because all the heavy stuff that I had done with regards to my father's estate was either done or there was nothing to do at that point. So I organized for us to go to Finland and we left on the 20th of uh, August, and we came back on the 29th. So we were there, we were gone, literally including travel time, uh, nine days. So we were in Finland for, for seven days. Some of that time was spent in Helsinki, and some of it was spent, as I said earlier, where my mother's family is from, I think it's called Ostrobotnia, area of Finland, or Pohjanmaa in Finnish. And uh, it was a bit of a whirlwind trip. It was a great trip though, on many levels. Um, it was really nice to see my family again. I hadn't seen them in 12 years, really. Well, I saw some of them about 10 years ago for another funeral, um, but I just haven't spent a lot of time in Finland. I spent all my summers there as a kid, but now that I've married an Uruguayan um, whose first family is there, we tend to focus on going there and I've also wanted to go to other places in the world. However, having been back to Finland now, I really, I would like to spend more time there. And it would have been really nice to organize, uh, you know, a gathering with some knitters, but that just wasn't going to happen this time at all. But I thought I'd show you. Um, I somehow managed to do a little bit of shopping, <laughs> as we do. 
And uh, there are two things that I got that I want to share with you in terms of yarn. Um, first, at a store called Menitha in Helsinki, my mother's cousin where we were staying happened to live a five minute walk from this store. And she knows that I'm a knitter, so she said, okay, let's take you to the store. And they had this yarn, which I've used before in their worsted weight version, called Pirkalanka. This is their fingering weight. I have used their worsted weight for a sweater that I made for Alejandro that didn't fit. You might remember that. Um, I made the Skaha sweater uh, by Marsha Ibuki, and uh, it ended up going and fitting me instead of fitting him. Um, I have been actually thinking about re-knitting with that yarn to actually make a sweater for Alejandro, so we'll see if that happens. So I ended up buying a sweater quantity with this combination. This cream is really blowing out the rest of them. The main color is this teal, and then the color work will be done in the light gray, which is coming out a bit too blown out, this lime green and the cream. And I'm thinking of making the Silver Frost Sweater by uh, Jennifer Steingas. Now, um, I also bought these colors thinking these would look really good on Alejandro, and I could also make him a sweater out of this. This is probably a color combination that would look good on, the, on both of us. However, I'm not sure a fingering white sweater is the best thing for him. I think I'd rather make him something thicker. So I will probably pull out the Skaha sweater and re-knit it for him. <clears throat> I, also, I have yarn left over for that, so it's easy to do. And I'll make the Silver Frost for myself with this. So hopefully that'll happen soon. I'm very happy to have found that yarn. Um, many that had lots of different yarns, but I really wanted some finished yarn. The other thing that I got that is actually quite fascinating, I'll just dump everything over there, is this stuff. I went into this kind of, um, it's sort of like a natural craft shop. I'm not quite sure how to call it. It's called Taito Shoppi. And they have a lot of, um, of, of, of uh, locally made, handmade things. And I went in there specifically to find uh, this uh, dishwashing brush that's made out of horsetail hair. And I have one from many years ago, and it's an excellent shape. And my mother-in-law said, would you mind finding one of those? So that's where they sold them. And while I was there, I bought two wonderful things. I bought um, some dish towels. Um, these are actually woven in Lapua, the small town where I spent my summers. Um, they're by Lapuan Kankuri, uh, which is, um, yeah, Lapuan Kankuri. And uh, they have beautiful woven woven makes. You can't really see it. It's in a light pink and cream. So I bought two tea towels for my for my kitchen. I've got other ones and um, I've got a bit of a tea towel thing. I love linen tea towels. Um, if it's 100% linen, even better. Um, so anyway, these ones may are sort of a cotton linen blend, I believe. So I got that from that store, but then they had the most amazing yarn there made out of paper. It's called paperinaru, which means a basically paper string. It came in different thicknesses. I bought the thinnest one, which is probably about a worsted weight, and I bought it in this red, bright red color. And I bought it in bright red because this is really meant more for making objects, decorative objects. Um, I'll put in a picture here because they're not the greatest pictures. I just took them for myself for getting ideas, but you can see um, a wreath, um, kind of a crocheted lamp, and uh, what I want to make is this sort of drapey curtain type thing. So I bought two of these, and I hope to make just this kind of like straight panel for Christmas that I would put in the window with lights in it. So let's hope that I'm successful in making that uh, and if that is the case um, I'm going to need more of this stuff but again it's it's meant for household items however it can be put in the washing machine at 30 degrees Celsius so that's pretty amazing and I can imagine it softens up a lot my mother said she remembers because this is actually a very uh, an old tradition in Finland 
she remembers that it was usually easier to work with if you wet it. Um, so anyway, I'll report back on that, but that was a really interesting find and they had a real, uh, like quite a selection of colors, but I decided that um, I love decorating at Christmas time and I thought this could be really nice. Yeah, so that was the trip to Finland really. Um, and the other acquisition I have that I'll just share with you is from something that happened recently. I told you, did I tell you about it already? The Kempville Yarn, yarn Festival. Um, I wasn't intending on buying yarn, um, but when I saw this, I just had to buy it because this is a um, essentially locally grown mohair and locally grown uh, Dorset Cherolet sheep. It's 75% mohair and 25% uh, of the Dorset Cherolet and it is meant to be a sock yarn and I thought a mohair sock yarn. With my love of mohair, how could I not? The mohair uh, goats are grown in Van Cleek Hill by a person called Belle Bouclette or the farm is called Belle Bouclette and it's in Van Cleek Hill and, um, and then this was dyed using calendula and dandelion root. And it's just a really nice yellow. Um, so I ended up buying that. But I've decided not to buy a lot of sock yarn these days because I'm just not on a big sock kick. So I figure the next socks that I do make are going to be the yarns that are really special in some way. And, and this will fall into that category. So I do have some other acquisitions, but I decided not to share them with you. There are quite a few books that I've gotten recently, uh, and perhaps I'll share those with you at another time. So that's really the end of the uh, making content of this. Um, if you're not going to continue watching, that's fine. I'm going to share a little bit of personal stuff from the last couple of months. Um, I'm going to call this the summer of bereavement. So there is more um, not so good news coming along. So if you don't want to watch, I totally understand. In that case, I'll bid you farewell and hope to see you again next time. If you're at Rhinebeck, please say hello. And don't forget to put a comment in the YouTube comment section if you want to enter for the Urso Yarn prize for the 4,000 subscribers. So there you go. Yeah, so those two comments are for everybody else who sticks around as well. Um, it has been the weirdest year of my life. I think that's what I'm going to call it. And I hope it remains that because I don't think I can relive this again. Um, as you know, my father passed away. You know, I, I ended up having to put his house on the market, my mother's house on the market. Um, not long after I put his house on the market, um, which has sold by the way, and I'm very, very happy about that. We'll be going this weekend to empty it of personal effects. And, and then I think, I hope that I can actually say goodbye to this chapter in my life. Um, so I did that and that took up most of July. And then Alejandro's parents arrived from Uruguay. Um, at the very end of July and um, his father came with some health issues so we were dealing with with the doctors uh, pretty much soon after he came he shouldn't have come but he did he really wanted to be here um, but then I found out that my mother's brother my uncle had died so I took my mother to Finland which was a wonderful trip as I said it was also a very emotional trip for me mm. it was just it was really nice connecting with people um, and it was just overall a good trip I did have to take care of my mom, so it was a little tiring, but that was okay. I was very, very glad to have done it. Um, we said goodbye to my uncle, and that was, that was a beautiful, beautiful ceremony as well. Upon return to Canada, my father-in-law passed away as well. Um, his health just didn't recover, and the doctors thought they could just stabilize him, um, but very suddenly, he passed away. So within the space of two months, Alejandro and I both lost our fathers um, and I've sold two houses and it's just been just a summer of bereavement. What can I tell you? Uh, and, and then of course, uh, because he passed away here, they had to, there was a whole ordeal around 
um, getting all that figured out for repatriation of ashes and so forth. So anyway, I won't go into details, but that's one of the reasons I just haven't podcasted for the last two months. I honestly, I have felt kind of bulldozed by this year and I'm now starting to see the light at the end of the tunnel, but it was just a very, very heavy and sad time and required some time to sort of just, just kind of process it all. But honestly, I've started feeling this week like, okay, this might be all normal now and we can move on with our lives and continue processing what needs to be processed, but not feel just uh, traumatized by all that's happened in the last few months. So anyway, that, uh, that is that. And um, I don't even know what else to tell you. It was actually, I, I even wondered if I should share. I didn't even share on Instagram when my father-in-law passed away because I just thought, I, I just can't do this. This is just too much. <laughs> it's just kind of crazy. So, but um, this is what life gives you every once in a while. And I think I've learned a lot. Like I've, I've realized how, as I said last time, how many layers they can be and also just how, yeah, just have to give yourself time. And um, I've really appreciated what other people have shared. People here on, on YouTube or on Instagram and people here in my life who've had loss and have just said, you know, just let yourself just kind of be for a while. Don't expect a whole lot. And I think when you just let yourself do that, uh, you know, it gets easier and easier and then suddenly you start feeling like, oh, the world is not quite so crazy. Doesn't mean that crazy things don't continue to happen. We had tornadoes here in Ottawa uh, a week ago. Um, that was that, or a little over a week ago, um, that had a pretty serious impact on people here in the area. We lost power, but only for 24 hours in my house. Things keep going, but um, when you're not completely bombarded constantly, you have a little bit more energy to to process these things. So that is what's been going on here. It's been, um, as I said, the strangest year, the most intense and emotional year. And I just hope that I can get back to some normalcy now. I'm really looking forward to just having a normal life. So I'm really crossing my fingers putting my thoughts out there and hoping that that is how it's going to be for a little bit so that I can regain um, just a sense of normalcy. Normal things that have happened, you know, school started, uh, Alejandro uh, accompanied his mother to Uruguay when they finally got all the paperwork and everything organized. Um, he has gone and come back and, and that was wonderful. In the meantime, the kids started school um, you know, and Isla had to change schools and that has gone really well, which is great. And she's very excited. It's a whole new level of independence and responsibility. She's gone to middle school. It's further away. She has to travel on public transportation and it's been, uh, it's been, um, an adjustment, but she's done really well. And, uh, yeah, everything else has been, everything else has been just fine. <laughs> and I hope it continues that way. So anyway, I, I decided to share this with you, although, you know, it just felt kind of strange and um, I thank you for the good thoughts that uh, you have sent my way. And um, I think that's it for now. I do hope, as I said, that life will get back to just a normal rhythm. It feels like it's starting to get there and I'll be able to podcast more regularly and just talk about the simple things in life. That's what I really hope. I hope that for all of us. So I think that's it. As I said uh, just a few minutes ago, I look forward to seeing you. If you happen to be at Rhinebeck, I'll definitely take some footage there. Don't forget about the YouTube um, giveaway if you're so inclined. And um, if you really want to make a comment and you don't want to enter the prize, feel free to come into the, into the Ravelry group as well. And uh, I'm going to be leaving you with a few more images of Finland, uh, a few more of Helsinki, and a few of the area where uh, my family comes from. And, um, and that's it. Thank you for joining me today, friends, and we'll see you next time. Bye-bye.